Good evening. Welcome, everyone, to the new Button Weezer Hall in the Arnhold Center of the 92nd Street Y. <laughs> I'm Annette Insdorf, the moderator for the Real Pieces series, and I'm very honored to be presenting tonight's film to you. When I first started writing my book, Indelible Shadows, Film and the Holocaust, and this was over 40 years ago, the majority of films about the Shoah focused either on Jewish victims or Nazi villains. There was very little about Jewish resistance or about the process of documenting that resistance. Today, that is fortunately no longer the case. In addition to fiction films like Defiance, there is a growing number of documentaries that chronicle how photographs were taken during World War II, what they could show as well as what they could not capture within a frame. These include Dariusz Jabloński's Photographer from Poland and uh, Jael Hersonski's A Film Unfinished from Israel and Bianca Stigter's Three Minutes A Lengthening and, of course, Julia Mintz's Four Winters. I very much look... <laughs> yep. <laughs> I very much look forward to discussing this film with her after the screening and the 10-minute intermission. And to introduce her film, please join me in welcoming Julia Mintz. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. It is, thank you so much for such a warm, illuminated welcome. <laughs> it is really wonderful to be here and a little difficult for me to stand in one place. Um, with that said, I really don't want to take up too much time here, but I'd like to share one of my favorite stories with you. And it's a story about Faye Schulman, who is one of the partisans you're going to meet in the film tonight. Faye was one of photographers who did document what was happening in the forest and with the resistance during World War II. And when I went to interview Faye, as I did with so many of the partisans that I interviewed, I would bring cameras and gear and flatbed scanners and we'd park ourselves in people's homes for days at a time. And after being with Faye, and working with her for these beautiful, sacred days, I'm getting ready to go, and we're in her kitchen, and she's making tea, and the sun's going down, and it's Shabbat, so she's kind of making me tea and trying to get me out of her house at the same time. And she takes my hands in hers, and she says, now my story is yours. And it is with so much pleasure, and now Faye is no longer with us in this realm, that I get to bring her story and the partisan stories to you. So without any further ado, Four Winters. I know some people are still making their way back in. Uh, actually, we are going to lower, however, the lights yeah. because it is shining in our eyes and we cannot see anything. Um, so if you can hear me backstage, could you please take it to half? Yeah. <laughs> I hope they hear me eventually. This is all new to us, by the way, the new Button Weezer Hall. This is my first time on this particular stage. So we are going to try to... Uh, <laughs> Okay, or actually, Susan, if you could notify the people backstage that the lights are way too high. <laughs> okay, so I am so grateful that Julia Mintz, the creator of the film that you have just watched, is here to answer our questions. I'm going to pose a few, and then we are going to open it up to audience questions as well. Um, I gather from, I think, a previous interview, I, I got to see this film for the first time at the New York Jewish Film Festival a few years ago. Uh, that would be a little too much. If you could bring the lights back, we want to be able to... We want to see you we guys. See we just you. want to get these yeah. cans down. Just a down little bit a little. more light on the audience, if possible. 
it'll, it'll work. Um, so I saw it at the New, okay, that, that's good, that's good. At the New York Jewish Film Festival, and I think you have said that this project originated with your seeing a photo of a female partisan. And I was hoping you could elaborate on that, you know, how this film took shape, and I have a feeling that it was specifically a female partisan <laughs> that grabbed your attention. Um, if you could tell us about that. Sure. The, um, well, I stumbled really upon this story for the first time when I read about this young girl who dug herself into a ditch and had a grenade and was determined to blow up a Nazi train that was headed to the front lines and lived to tell the story. And it was really in that moment that I realized, hey, there's a film here. And, um, I, I really felt like there was this Jewish Joan of Arc and I wanted to make a biographical film about her. And then I learned that there were over 25,000 of these young and some older, but mostly young people and many of them were women that banded together in the forest like you saw and fought back against the Nazis and the collaborators. And it really wasn't too long before I buried myself in research and, um, and then one after the other after the other, I just sought out partisans all over the world and interviewed them and began to learn about their history. And yes, the women's stories were very important to me because, well, I'm a woman, right? So I'm pretty aware of how often our stories aren't always part of the collective history in the way that I've often sought to find. So I think I naturally gravitated toward these women that I think spoke to me because I, well, naturally, I always wondered who would I be if I was there then? How would I have, how would I have journeyed forward? And so I was very interested in learning more about that and the men too. But I think that the women's stories definitely played an inspiring role on a gender specific basis and to sort of mine their journey was quite fascinating to me and the manifestation of courage and how they had to kind of abandon their gender or their learned sort of femininity at that moment in time and culture and history and to sort of shed like Luba I mean she had to shed her motherhood and you know she starts like oh I didn't need to bring a nightgown to the forest I mean she went from being a mommy to putting bullets in her room to kill the Nazis. I mean, these are sort of significant shifts that it was quite fascinating. And I was really honored that they entrusted their stories to me to bring them forward for all time, for all of us. It was quite brave of them to go back and relive what they had gone through. It's quite a gift that they've given us. Yeah. And do you have in your own family history any particular Holocaust connections, or are you an American Jew who came at this from a more objective standpoint? Well, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I am Eastern European Jewish heritage, and a big part of my family that I never knew was in Europe, and so we didn't really speak about my side of the family that we never knew. Um, and. I had in my family, there were, you know, during Jewish holidays, there were people with tattoos, but, you know, I was sort of raised that we're not talking about that tonight. Um, and so I think it was more of a, I think what was most fascinating, really, was I didn't know how much I had inherited through the American lens until I began to explore the story through a different lens. So my experience of learning about the Holocaust I grew up in public school in America, and um, so I really learned about Anne Frank. You know, she was my, she was the one. I didn't have Gertie, in fact, when my daughter was at day school, and she was like, we're doing a biography fair, and I'm going to be Anne Frank. And I was like, no, <laughs> you're not. You're going to be Frida Kahlo. <laughs> you know, we'll start with that one. And, um, or Gertie Boyarsky someday, you know, maybe these girls will have another opportunity to learn about a different identity of coming of age in the forest, you know, and their struggles with their own sexuality and virginity in those moments in time versus what Anne Frank suffered through. Um, and uh, so my lens that I grew up with 
was you know, this sort of public school lens and of course the Nazis lens because those were the onslaught of the images that we inherited in our country that I was schooled on the Holocaust through. So as I delved more deeply into this journey and the archives, I sort of kept winding my way to find the images that not only were shot by those who survived this tale and for many who didn't, but the lens, I kept seeking the lens of the non-Nazi lens. And often I would like scrub through footage and it was like at the end when the Nazis were like putting down the camera or they started to get sloppy, I would find like these little snippets like where the guy has his hands up in the opening and he turns his eyes to the left and to the right. And I saw that on one clip in one art collage, you know, on one piece of footage. And then I kept searching and then I finally found like the extra, you know, four seconds on the reel where you see the guy panic and you see the Nazi look at the cameraman, like turn that off, you know? And so I really sought out the images that were from the point of view that you really traveled with the partisans and through the Jewish lens or the victim's lens. And so that, that became a big part of my understanding of how much I didn't know mm -hmm. was in the mining of these archives and then finding the images that really married to the stories that were being told to me for all of us. And were all of the interviews recorded before you did the archival research? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, because I think all of us noticed that so often your archival footage corroborates <laughs> something that was just said by one of the partisans. And there's a kind of rhythmic relationship between what we hear and see in close up of the survivor's face and what we then see, and we know that it's not exactly footage of that person, right. but it has this effect of uh, authenticating, in a way, the personal story. Mm. Mm. What was the greatest challenge for you? And here, um, it can be in terms of speaking to the partisans, or in terms of research, or in terms of shaping the film, but I'm, I'm always wondering what the greatest challenge is for a filmmaker, and also what was the greatest surprise for you in doing the research? Well, there was a lot of challenges. <laughs> um, you know, when I started out to make this film, the, one of the largest challenges was, as I was making this film in a very unconventional way for a historical documentary film, because like yourself, there were so many scholars that informed this work I mean, deep scholarships. I have quite a beautiful library. And, but from the beginning, I always knew that because this felt to me like it was the very last telling of this story from those who lived it, it was very important that I only had them speaking. And so this was quite risque when you saw it on paper. And there were not so many folks that felt really confident because often in historical documentary films, you know, you have the people who live the history and then you have the scholars on camera sort of authenticating it and helping pontificate on what those other folks lived through. And sometimes that's really important and incredibly valid, but for this journey on this film, I really wanted only the partisans themselves to speak and I wanted to intercut their stories. So finding enough people finding the overlap, really crafting and writing this script painstakingly um, was both. The funding at the beginning was really hard because people didn't know, you know what I was up to. And, um, and then the other piece was in the, in the sort of um, how, how to tell it beyond that element, which was you know, the film follows a linear timeline but it really actually is a thematic timeline. It really follows um, sort of an emotional, ethical, um, moral journey. And that's the linear line within the film, is like sort of this, you start innocent, and then sort of this sort of shock and awe, and then the manifestation of bravery, and what they go through much more on the spiritual and personal level. I mean, these were young, innocent people. And um, actually, I want to take a minute and do a call out to, I say this young, innocent people because I have a couple of producers here tonight in the audience. And uh, Peter Stein's here. Peter, will you just put your hand up there? And um, <laughs> he's one of our producers. 
and Ellen, you're here tonight, who's also one of our producers who I'm so glad is in the house, Ellen Steiner, and Zen is here too, Zen Chia, and I don't know if there's other producers out here in the audience or team members, but the team was essential in making this film, and I couldn't have done it without you, and your belief in me, and helping carry it forward, and I really, I worked with my producers from the beginning to watch the film and feel its craft and to make sure that we were really carrying this story forward. In, it was, it's pretty non-traditional. I mean, you really go through this journey as a historical documentary in an emotional narrative of the characters. So you're really traveling with them through time, but really through their hearts and experientially of what they had to go through. So that was a big challenge, you know, to kind of make it land, so, and I heard y'all laughing, so that was good, and, uh, you know, how do you, how do you bring people to laugh and cry and uh, breathe, so. How many hours of footage did you amass before the actual editing process began? <laughs> I don't know, it's pretty, it's an incriminating question, like hundreds, I mean, really, I interviewed, um, when I went to people's homes, I stayed with them for sometimes like a four or five days. And I would interview people and we'd go through their stories because, you know, especially when you're with folks in my experience that are so much older and they tell you their stories, a lot of the time, well, I'll just be candid, you know, you, you, know, you say to somebody, where's the best place to get chocolate milk? And they'll say, well, you gotta go three doors down, you'll pass Saul's house, and then after you pass Saul's house, you might see my friend Sarah, and if you see Sarah along the way, can you say hi to her and go, to, go three blocks down? And I like the one with the blue label, but if you get the red label, that's okay. And you're like, okay, so the store at the end of the block? <laughs> you're like, okay. So a lot of the time, the best stories come through these circuitous sort of narratives. I mean, you just don't know where things are gonna land, and when people are, recalling things from 75, 80 years ago, it's really important to give that time, give that pace. I mean, and sometimes they need to tell a story a few times because we were building trust between each other. And then each time you kind of take a deeper dive with someone, they might share quite a bit more. Um, or they did, you know, there was, there was quite a bit of a reveal. I mean, people told me things that they had never shared before. And, um, and I think that's because, you know, we kind of sat through it together. We took that journey. Well, one of the things I found really powerful is how you juxtaposed the individual different people telling the story that corroborated one another. For example, um, I think it's Michael, uh, both Isidore mm -hmm. uh, Farbstein and Michael Stoll recall the train to, to Treblinka and you cross cut between them and then you include some archival footage of a train in motion which adds urgency or propulsion to the stories that they're telling. I also so appreciated Luba and Frank talking about shooting the rifle for the first time. You could almost believe that they were doing it together in history because they, they're brought together by the editing or creating a dugout. At what point did you, st I mean, you say you scripted it. So it's when you knew that you had two people talking about the same thing in similar ways that you then, with your editor, uh, is it Peter Hetty? Um, that, that, that that's how you then structured the, the script and the, the rest of the film? Kind of, yes. And I think what happened was, you know, when I interview people, I have a tendency to ask a lot of micro questions. And, um, and then as we go through it and I ask the questions, a lot of the time, I sort of, I, if you saw my books, <laughs> each book is a transcript. And then I identify in the margins the different themes. So it would be the manifestation of bravery and learning to use your weapons or the acquisition of arms. And so then I would catalog all the different people that I spoke with, in fact, I'm working, on my, one of my next big projects is we're doing a book because I interviewed 30 people for this film. So you, so the stories that you see were actually very much stories that were mined, that were the common story. So even though you might be seeing a singular story about 
you know, Gertie's virginity, it wasn't just Gertie who had that story. She was telling the collective story of that experience or learning to use a gun or what it was like to be inside the train and Michael's experience of that. And so I very carefully put stories that were in the film that spoke to the larger story, the larger collective experience of the partisans themselves. And so it was incredibly painful taking people out of the film. You know, there were several more characters, but at some point you kind of have to, like the horses in Central Park, you know, and it's so difficult, but you kind of pull it together and you, you, find, you find the pulse, as you said, and the ones that really tell not only their own story, but the larger story, like there was another person who also jumped from a train, but Isidore sort of talked about being shot at, and I thought that that was a really important element. Like it wasn't just that you had to jump, but people were murdered when they jumped. And so that was a really important piece. And Michael representing the push and the pull of what that experience was like. So I wanted to make sure that I represented the holistic sensibility that I had gleaned from the experiences of so many folks that I had interviewed. And that was really important to me. So it was a lot of the repeating stories then dictated the stories and the themes that found themselves landing in the film. And it was difficult because there were some incredibly beautiful stories that didn't get to be in the film because they were, from my research, much more singular within their telling. And so that was hard, you know? Like for example, Gertie, she survived typhus. And um, they, had, uh, they had like the Zimblancas for quarantines actually. And they would quarantine those that had typhus in bunkers. And when she says, um, why me? Why did I survive? And that was part of her story was she was the last one in. I'm sorry, she was the first one in and the last one to come out of the bunker alive from mm. typhus. So, you know, this is an incredible story and it's hers, but it just felt like it was too personal and kind of took us down a different rabbit hole than um, the story of her survival as a whole and the questions she asked about it. So it was really about kind of culling the stories to the one that sort of tells the larger story. That is a hell of a challenge. And, and I could not help thinking when I first saw the film, what a great companion piece Four Winters makes to Partisans of Vilna. That was the first major documentary to give voice to Jewish partisans telling their collective tale through the individual testimonies. It was produced by and written by Aviva Kempner and directed by Josh Waletsky. And you even have one of the same people interviewed. It's uh, Hayala Pajewski, Pajef, Pajewski, who I knew as a child because my father was a jeweler on 47th Street in the same exchange as Haya and her husband, Simon Pajewski. I had no idea at the time that these were heroes of World War II, mm. that these were partisans. All I knew is they spoke Yiddish to my father all the time. <laughs> And then when I saw Partisans of Vilna, I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> she was this. And then after seeing your film, um, I realized I gotta learn more about her. She also, uh, if, if I remember correctly, she um, co-founded an organization dedicated to preserving the cultural legacy of Lithuanian Jewry. Um, was Partisans of Vilna an inspirational text for you? Well, Aviva Kempner is an inspirational force of nature, so we'll start with that. In fact, I wish she was able to be with us tonight, but yeah. she's with her new film, and she's premiering it in Chicago. Yes. And she's actually sharing our film in Chicago with her film uh, this evening. Um, so, yes, I mean, the one thing that's wonderful about the Partisans of Vilna is I think the majority of the whole film is in Yiddish, and so... That's really lovely because you can hear people speaking in their native voice. And um, so I think that was one of the pieces that's very special um, if you really want to kind of touch, have that touchstone. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a really lovely piece of work. Yeah. And in both films, um, I think you feel that sense of a collective protagonist, that no one person can be called the hero of the Holocaust. You, you have to listen to the varying points of view. But I must confess that after watching the film a second time, 
I cannot get Faye Shulman out of my head, um, precisely because she was not only a brave partisan with her rifle, she was the chronicler. She had the camera, she knew how to use it. Absolutely. And I gather there are about 100 of, of her photographs that remain. Um, and she's able to keep for posterity images that are amazing. But for me, the best of all is that she had a leopard coat and a matching hat. That stylized feel that she brought to the photos, there's a group shot in, in which we actually see her. How did you find Faye Shulman? How did I find Faye? Well, I don't, I don't remember exactly how I found Faye, but I can tell you a funny story. When I was with Faye and we were in her apartment, she was also um, a painter and she was very vital. And something happened, my crew had a light and a this and a that, and the painting was down from the wall and leaning against the kitchen table and it started to timber. And Faye darted across the room and grabbed the painting and I remember saying to her, like, Faye, you're not 98, are you? <laughs> and it was a really interesting beginning of something that I didn't know, which was so many of the young girls that were in the forest and in DP camps after the war, because they were so young, they often, along with their papers, they had to falsify documents. And often they were to get married at very young ages so they could travel on or leave the country and stuff. And she said, well, I don't really know exactly how old I am. And we kind of had a giggle. And I thought, OK, I won't press the button here. But um, she was really such an extraordinary woman. And it was such a pleasure to, it was more than a pleasure. I don't even know if that's the right word. It was, it was like you meet a legend. You meet someone who, I mean, I think in this field, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you get to meet a lot of personal heroes. and. I think the partisans are funny because they start like that, but I think after so many hundreds and hundreds of hours with the footage and with the transcripts, they, they really start to become like family. And right. it's, it's strange, you know? I mean, I, it's Zen and I, I think we've been on the road with the film now and Peter and Ellen, you know, we see this film over and over again and Isidore's like, and I had two skates and like every time he makes me smile. I'm like, yeah, you did, it's great. You know, like, I can't help it, or Mike, and I was in the green room, and, you know, you eat a piece of bark, like, it's all in my head, and sleep a little longer, like, you know, you just hear them, and I'll be in the kitchen in my own house, and I, a thought, a thought came to my head. Like, they're just, they've become part of, I'm just so grateful, they've just become a part of me. Well, they, they each, each one has a distinctive voice, accent, your close-up camera, it's just close enough to capture, you know, you almost feel like you're with them, but it's, it's not invasive, it's not intrusive. Um, with Faye Shulman, I mean, at one point my husband Mark leaned over to me and said she reminded him of her mother, of his mm -hmm. mother, Regina Berman Toporek. She was a partisan too at the age of about oh. 12 or 13. Um, so this, this story is close to me through marriage, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, but Faye Shulman strikes me as someone about whom a fiction feature yeah. should be made. Absolutely. Has that crossed your path at any point, either from your thinking, or did anyone approach you about rights to her story? Or Well, I definitely have thought, I mean, there's, you know, if you mentioned it in the introduction. I mean, I keep thinking that Quentin Tarantino, I don't know if anybody is friends with him, but I think that it would be really great for Quentin to see the film. And we're actually, I understand that he lives in Israel for part of the year. So we're going to be taking the film to Israel. And I would really like to invite him. And I think it would be very fun to do an Inglorious Bastards and the Partisans. I think it would just be so cool. And I'd love for you and Nat to have Quentin and I have a <coughs> chat together. But um, I think that in terms of a film, you know, I think we have that, and we have Defiance, which was on the Bilskis, right. and, um, and by the way, I'm not really joking about that, um, but I think that, uh, you know, yeah, I think there's definitely all sorts of, like, these stories, it's like so many, you know, there's so much, there's such just extraordinary stories of the human spirit, and I think at this moment in time, when we're seeing fascism rise and the rise of neo-Nazism and we're witnessing day in and day out what's happening in the Ukraine and they manifesting their bravery to defend their lives and their homes. I mean, 
this is, you know, this is, yes, a fictional film could be made, but I think that it's a really important reminder that, you know, we're in a time where we haven't, we haven't been in a time like this in my lifetime. And I think that the film is a really powerful reminder of how important it is that we find our voices and we manifest our own bravery in the face of what is happening in the world today. And it's humbling to think about how fragile society has always been. But I think what's deeply important and I hope is awakened in everybody who see this film is you know, the importance of our work to really understand that fragility and do what we can to protect it. What strikes me now that seeing Four Winters in 2023 is even more significant and moving because you've got a portrait of brave young Jewish resistors. And I think in our time, maybe this moment, um, it's even more important for us to see that than it was, say, in 2018. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, have Facialman's photographs been published at all as, as a group of at least 100 photos? Is, or is that something that might happen still? There's a book that was written about Faye, a memoir that I know um, was published in Canada, in Toronto. Uh, we just got back from Hot Docs and I was trying to get in touch with the publishers because I thought it would be cool to have the books out. And I think that there has not been, as far as I know, a book of Faye's photographs, although I do know that there was a tour that was going at different museums at one point of some of her photographs and I was hoping that at some point we could bring her photos and the film together in some location as we travel around the world. But no, I don't think there's been the kind of coffee table book that I think you're referring to. And, I would um, like to I see it. I would love to you see know, that. I, I think um, it, it, they, they look in the film so fragile at times and vulnerable. And at other moments, I think this is hard, solid evidence. This was taken from the eyewitness and engaged person point of view. I wish I could look at them mm -hmm. myself and preferably in slightly cleaned up fashion. Obviously they were taken and developed under a certain duress physically <laughs> and it would be great to look at them in the way that I think they deserve. Um, and speaking of images, um, you mentioned going through archives and looking for certain things. Um, these days when I see documentaries, I so wish that I knew whose point of view I'm seeing archival footage through. Um, how, from where do most of your images come? Is it from the Soviet photographers or, or filmmakers? Is some of it from the Nazi archives? I mean, some of it from American? The footage that you're looking at in the film was definitely, there was some, especially the early stuff, there's the German archives, I mean, the Germans, I, I, I'm sort of talking about the archives, really, because it's not really the archives, it's the cinematographer. Right. So I would say there were Nazi photographers, there were um, citizen, like, you know, people, uh, whether they were collaborators or bystanders or uh, fighters, you know, just civilian photographers. And then there were partisans, Russian partisans, Soviet partisans, the Polish armies. So the footage came from all over and we had teams in Lithuania and Belarus and Poland and Israel and across the United States and the most significant amount of our footage actually came from the individual partisans that we interviewed. They had collected their own sort of archives, oops, that's my mic, um, archives of their own stories and so they had, and that's what I love so much at the end when you know, uh, Sarah's holding up the picture like, that's me. <laughs> that's me with the grenade on my belt. And um, that's a great story. I guess it was at Liberation. And uh, I think it was for her, I think that photograph was taken by an American soldier. And um, so different photographs were taken, you know, at the end, some of those photographs were taken at DP camps. The early, a lot of the early footage were photographs that the partisans themselves had, but they acquired it most often after the war, years later, because their mother or their cousin or their sister or the brother had taken some 
vacation footage or had a camera when they went to visit them overseas. And so these are cherished, cherished photos and you know, part of their life story that they collected. Sometimes they would have like little tiny clips from movies that one of their children or a friend saved. So the archives um, that we see in this film, I actually think it's one of the sort of most significant collections of resistance footage according to Michael Berenbaum, who's the former you know, founding, I think, director of the United States Holocaust Museum. He's uh, talked to me quite a bit um, about sort of the significance of what this film holds as a historical sort of piece of collective history. Yeah. Michael Berenbaum is an extraordinary person. <clears throat> He's the one who actually took my husband Mark and me through Auschwitz. I had never been to Auschwitz um, until 2015, and uh, I was kind of he hesitant to go because my mother had been interned there. And he took us, and it was one of the most um, difficult, challenging, and memorable days of my life, partly because he is so incredibly knowledgeable about every detail in that concentration camp. And uh, anyone who has his ear as an advisor for a film or to look at is lucky. Um, I feel very lucky. <laughs> one more question. We're going to open it up in a moment. Um, and by the way, I was assuming that it would be live questions. That's what I'm used to. I gather you were just now writing on cards, which oh. uh, if that's the case, OK. But I kind of prefer hearing the voice of the person. Me too. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll play that one by ear. A question about the music. Because very often I see both fiction and documentary movies where I'm angered by the intrusive score that seems to be kind of keying my emotions too much as opposed to allowing the voices and the places to resonate. Could you talk about how you approach it? Because you do have, for example, that wonderful waltz at the beginning when we see the uh, partisans for the first time. And I so love that you have Leonard Cohen's Dance Me to the End of Love with the end credits. How did you conceive of it? Was the music all composed or put in afterwards or before? Oh, absolutely after. I mean, we definitely spotted the film with temporary, you know, music temp is what we call it. And um, the ideas for the music were always sort of hand in hand with how each scene would unfold. And, you know, the, the music, as you said, I mean, I, I hope you were saying that it didn't hit you it over did, the no, head. Absolutely not. It was very effective. Yeah, the, I worked with some brilliant composers, um, and uh, Mike Higby wrote the, that waltz that you hear, and he named it Partisan Waltz, and uh, we worked in the studio together with that, and I love that piece, and it visits us throughout the film with different, you know, we do different mixes of it, and I pulled out different stems, and it's actually a theme that weaves in and out, even sometimes just as a very sparse layer, even when they're blowing up the trains. There's right. a little bit of that waltz. I, I kind of took one of the threads of that. Um, and uh, yeah, John Silberman did a beautiful, there's so different composers, Khalif Neville of the Neville Brothers' second son. He did some of the riffs coming in. And um, I really targeted the music to echo, again, the theme but not, the, not to be didactic or to tell you where to go, but to really kind of marry with the pacing or the intention of the scene. So when I work with the composers, I always try and have the music speak to the unspoken, not the spoken word. So for example, we were talking a little bit in the green room, there's uh, the piece of music at the end where Chaya talks about how her father used to play this song. And Interestingly enough, you know, I chose a piece of music in that scene that wasn't historic at all. Um, so clearly it wasn't a song that her father would have played. It was chosen to match the emotion of her experience of her father's song. So I, I was sort of, most of the time, I was really looking to drill into what the storyteller was communicating. And, so even when someone was talking about like the manifestation of bravery, it was actually fear. And so the, the, the bed or what's happening underneath that is a dialogue between bravery and fear. And so I would really kind of work with the composers in that way. And, um, and it was a joy. I mean, it, it's really something to be able to have 
all these, you know, that's, that's filmmaking, right? I mean, that's the coolest thing. I started in my life as a um, visual artist and I'm a stone carver and a potter uh, by trade. And, um, and I remember the first time I got into the like studio and all of a sudden it was like all these brilliant artists and I got to work with them and collaborate and I was like, oh man, this is the coolest thing ever. And uh, it was so fun to just not be in my own head and I got to be in my own head with, their, with everybody else in their own head and then coming together. And so working with composers and musicians to bring forward those themes, I mean, it's extraordinary. It's uh, Barbara Cohen composed those opening music pieces with the cello and went back and forth and yeah, it's lovely. It's stuff. I mean, I, I hope you will realize that when a documentary filmmaker decides to tackle a subject as rich as this one, it ain't just research and interviews and <laughs> editing. You know, there are layers that have to be interwoven because a fiction film and a documentary both have to have the narrative spine and the proper accompaniment. I'm gonna ask for the cards to at least be brought out here, but I think I would rather call on people in a moment, especially because I didn't even bring my glasses to the stage since I didn't know that they were gonna be written cards. If uh, whoever can hear me can bring out some cards, I'll see if I can even decipher them. And in the meantime, actually we have a question. Somebody raised a hand pretty high right here. I can repeat every question. Thank you very much. Go right ahead. How long did it take you to do the film? Well, I mentioned earlier, it really was a passion project from its first, the first moment, the first day. Would you like to borrow mine? Uh, no, it's, it's okay. uh, I, I think I'll figure it out, but hopefully whoever wrote the two cards is still here <laughs> and we can call on the people directly, but go ahead. Oh, um, well with COVID we went on hold um, because it was so important to us to be able to bring the film into audiences and to have people come together for the film, so we went on hold. But the film, it really was about a decade long. I mean, it was on and off. I was making many other films along the way to cover the mortgage and you know, take care of my kids. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a long journey. But it was upside down. I mean, the first chunk was doing reading everybody's books and interviewing people. And then we kind of put a pin in it and, um, and then I started writing and crafting and building it out. So, you know, I would say on and off for about a decade, there was some, some holes, but the, um, but the, it was actually, interestingly enough, even though it took a decade, I think it was the fastest project I'd ever done because the, the focus was in place. We knew what we wanted. And, you know, usually when we work on films, right, there's, co-producers and there's a lot of different people in the kitchen and they got to watch it and everybody's got to, but you know, I did write, produce and direct it. So um, <laughs> I really relied on my team and other folks to get involved, but the vision was, the partisan spoke so clearly to me. It was not really a big leap. So if you actually added up the hours, it was really quite swift and there was so much talent in the room with me I mean, I say, you know, the music and the composers and my editors, and it was beautiful collaboration, and I think everybody really knew what it was about and had a passion for the story, and um, so it went actually quite swiftly over a decade. <laughs> it was more than four winters, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> right here? Mm -hmm. from the frame. So I have a friend here who on the way to Auschwitz with her mother and sister, mother saw the uh, wood on the floor, she ripped the wood, she put, she put all this down and she has made beautiful life. And they we were just told an amazing story by this woman who knows who knows someone who, similar to the story Michael tells of escaping from the train, on, in the train on the way to Auschwitz, a mother managed to pull a piece of wood out from the floor and got her two daughters to escape through that hole. Did the mother go with them or no? No, mother is gone, but the daughter, she said, run to the forest. forest. She told the daughters to run to the forest, which they did. Wow, that, I, I, 
That's an amazing tale. And the survivor got involved in charity, helping Jews from other countries. Yes. You know, it's a, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know um, that when Faye and her leopard coat were ready to leave Europe, she told me that she buried her coat in the ground. So she had said at that time, she felt that that was the safest, best thing to do. So. I, and actually, I guess it, you, the answer to your question is maybe in the film that Faye kept burying mm -hmm. her photos and her equipment because, of course, had they been found, that would have been terribly dangerous. Yeah. It would have revealed the, the whereabouts. So my, my guess is that um, unlike a weapon, a rifle, which you would keep on you at all times, the photographs were indeed hidden. And, and she said at one point in the film that even if she didn't survive, the photos would survive as testament. I don't think any of the partisans actually thought that they would survive. In fact, it's interesting. Um, you may have noticed when Gertie says, and, and the bullets came around and he killed me. And I thought the first time I interviewed, as I mentioned, lots of people. And the first time, Gertie was the first person who I heard say that. And then it was fascinating because lots of partisans that I interviewed said those words. They would say, and they killed me. And it, Early on, I thought it was sort of an English translation thing, but what I learned over time was it was really the moment that they felt, I think, that they severed themselves from who they were before. And so mm. the person who they were was killed that day. Yeah. And then I think they moved on from there. It was interesting. Wow. Um, I think I see a hand on the far right there and then on the aisle here. woman or man? Oh, I'm sorry. There were two of you. I, I, you started talking to the man first, and then we'll go straight to the woman. So congratulations. Thank you very much. I spoke to you very quickly outside. I just want to elaborate a little bit. So you flew up from Atlanta to be here because you have a lot of people here that would love to see you now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a great story of to share it, right? It's, I mean, yeah. it's the craziest. Well, the short story. answer is that's Zen, and she has our contact information, and we'd love to learn more about your dad's story and talk to you. And we always give up her to see Parade. If anybody hasn't seen Parade, it's so clear. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank All right. you. Uh, the woman right in front, and then the gentleman on the aisle. Um, Did any of the partisans interviewed know each other? The partisans in the film, um, not, not the ones that were in the film, over the many people that I interviewed, some of them did know each other. Shalom Yaron um, was friends with Chaya, Chayeli, and um, Michael, you know, yes, over the people that I interviewed, but not the ones in the film. Okay, uh, on the aisle here. So many of these people were teenagers, 18, 19. 
16, 15. 16. Did they share many stories of romance? The question is, these teenagers, 15, 16, 18, did they share any stories of romance? You know, one of the things that I found so interesting was Frank Blakeman talked quite a bit about um, his siblings and many of the partisans that escaped into the woods, they were from families. They had brothers and they had sisters. And I think that because the Jewish partisans were often in brigades with Soviet and Russian and the Poles and everybody was on the run and your brigade would get blown up and then somebody was running. I think in many ways they was a very much familial and I think the women often were in danger um, for obvious reasons and I think that some of the Jewish men sort of expressed that you know when your when your life is in jeopardy you know that's that's sort of both on your mind and not on your mind but often when the men were sort of being aggressive with the women they would really want to step in because they kept thinking about, well, that could be my sister. And I heard that several times over. So I think that there was a protective quality because these girls were quite young and on their own. And they were all orphans, really. I mean, most of the people I interviewed were orphaned and they weren't just orphaned from their parents, but they were orphaned from their siblings. You know, They were really on their own. And so I think that the deeper relationship well, I see the thing is, is they also had their guard up because at any given moment, somebody would die. Their friends, their comrades were being blown up. You know, as Frank said, on the left, on the right, they had to become soldiers. So I think these relationships were very complex. And I do, yes. I mean, Gertie, Luba, you know, as, as Luba says, you wanted to live, you know? So when it was quiet, yes, I think that there was sex. And, um, because we know there was abortion as we cover in the film. So I think it's more a part of life. But I think, there was the, I think it's sort of a consciousness about what they were faced with that I can't even really, I understand the elements of it, but I think I'd need a couple PhDs to really be <laughs> able to have an opinion about it. Actually, one way to respond to that is in Partisans of Vilna, the film I referenced earlier, you actually hear this beautiful Yiddish song, and it's sung by Josh Waletsky, who directed the film. Um, and the lyrics to this beautiful melody are, do you remember how I taught you how to hold a rifle in your hands? Uh, it, what was that? Still That's it, still thank you. Susan. And uh, <laughs> Susan's also on my advisory board. <laughs> I recognize that voice. And I mention this only because I think for a lot of the young partisans, what would have been in normal times a romantic impulse was subsumed into Survival. the romance of brave fighting, of partisanship, of the collective. And so I, I, I'm not that surprised that you didn't hear constant stories about romance in the dugout, so to speak. I think we have time for about one more question. If there is one, go right ahead here. Oh, yes. How do you feel about like, younger generations not learning about this stuff? How do you feel about younger generations not learning about this stuff? You know, I would like to know how you feel about younger generations <laughs> not learning this stuff. I just want to make sure you all hear this young man who's saying that in schools these buddy? days. 13. You're 13. Um, schools don't really touch on this very much, maybe Anne Frank and the war, but not on these stories, which he knows because of his father. Thanks, Dad. Uh, I think a lot about that, actually. So thank you for asking that question. And he's not a plant. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm a fan. I, you know, this is very, very important to me. This is actually, you know, when people say, why did you make this film? Really, I made this film because I didn't know the story. I, I didn't know it. And I wanted to know it. And once I started knowing it, I thought, wow, 
everybody needs to know this. And for me, you know, the Holocaust, when I was growing up, I kind of, I turned away from it because I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't really see it. And when I started to understand it through this portal of bravery and resistance and, and what they had to go through, all of a sudden, there was a whole lot of room within me to keep going, to keep exploring it and wanting to know more and more and more. And all of a sudden, I'm that gal in the subway talking to everybody about the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a really, it was a pretty interesting um, piece for me. I mean, I've spent my career making films about all sorts of things and social justice and human rights. And all of a sudden, I was kind of turning the lens on my own personal story of my own people, my own history. And, it was very, very exciting to me, and it still is. And I feel strongly, and I'm looking forward to bringing the film out educationally in all communities across this country and around the world. And we definitely have plans for that. And if folks are interested in helping us out with that and supporting that effort and helping us bring the film out into the world, you know, Zen's passing out flyers on your way out. And if you have recommendations of places and people and universities, along the way, we want, we want more than six million people to see this movie, and I would love more than three million of them to be young people. <laughs> that seems like a perfect way to thank everyone for being with us tonight, and to thank Julia Mintz for bringing us her remarkable film. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, my dear. <laughs>